Fourth and fifth graders, you guys are dismissed to Kids Church. If you have your Bible with you this morning, we are in Romans chapter 15. We are going to be looking at just one verse this morning, verse 13. Uh, If you've been here for a while, you're probably familiar with this verse. This is the verse that um, I pray every Sunday morning as we leave. Uh, May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him so that we might overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's been, I don't know, eight or nine years since I talked about the origin of that verse. Uh, When I was a church planter back in 2003, it was giving me my first pastorate, and we would have meetings with our plant team. There was about, I don't know, 15 adults uh, that were a part of the church before there was a church. And we would visit about once every couple of weeks and we'd talk about, you know, what kind of church and what do we want here and that. And one week I came back to them and said, you know, as much as we are a untraditional church of we're meeting in an office building in the middle of nowhere and there's all kinds of stuff that were different. I said, I think I just want one element every week that's the same. One element that feels a little traditional. And they're like, well, what do you, I'm so, well, I'd like a benediction prayer. And they were open to it. And so I began to look through scripture for these examples of prayers. And I I came to these prayers in Romans 15 that really just jumped out at me because Paul was praying for the church and he was kind of tying everything in the book of Romans together here at the end. And the church had been in conflict. And, you know, we've been talking the last couple of weeks about the Former Jewish, now Christian believers were practicing the festivals and the ex-pagan ones were like, I don't want to celebrate those holidays. And, and so there was all this conflict and Paul brings it all back together with the, his hope for the church. And so the reason that we pray that every Sunday morning, the reason I pray it over you every Sunday morning is because if that was Paul's hope for the church in Rome, then I see the correlation for his hope, my hope, for our church. And I I can't every Sunday go through uh, what we're about to go through, but I want you to know that every Sunday, this is what I'm thinking, okay? That this, this prayer is incredibly impactful when we begin to look at it in different pieces, And my goal every Sunday is to send you out with the hope and the joy and the peace that this verse offers. That no matter what it is that we come together to talk about on a Sunday morning, whether it's, you know, the Jew festivals and the pagan rituals, or it's all the stuff we talked about in Romans 8 and 9 and all those things, like whatever it is that we talk about when we open God's word, we should leave with hope. So that's why we pray this. And that's why I want us to take the time this morning to come back to it and see really what Paul says in this. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this whole verse, this whole prayer hinges on the God of hope, right? That God is the origin of hope. And here's one of those times where the Greek gives us a little deeper meaning. He's just come out of verse 12, where he's reminded the church about this prophecy about the Gentiles will have hope. And then he immediately flows into this prayer for them. Because God is the God of hope, may the God of, and if we read it literally, it would say, may the God of the hope. It's not the God of hope in general. It's not, well, because we know, God, we are hopeful. You know, we're hopeful for so many things, and our hope comes and goes. It, 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 sometimes it's big and sometimes it's small. Any one of us who was watching college football last night, right? Like, hope does this the whole time. And if you'd have watched my house, you would have seen times when I was up moving around and times when I was sunk in the sofa last night, right? And just kept going back and forth because our 
when we think of hope, we think of circumstances. Well, if our circumstances are good, then I have more hope. Or when our circumstances are just so bad, then we can just hope against hope. That is not what he's saying. This is the God of the hope. Not a hope. Not hope as we know it. The hope that only comes from knowing Jesus Christ. This is that hope for eternity. This is the hope for now. And when he says the God of the hope, well, that hope stays right here. It never changes. It never gets lower. And it can't go any higher because it is perfect just the way it is. The God of the only, the only certain hope. The author of Hebrews says this. He says, people swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all arguments. He says, look, when y'all are talking to each other, you say, well, I'm gonna swear by so-and-so because he was there and he'll testify on my behalf. And people say, well, that ends the argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with his own oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. This specific hope greatly encourages us. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus had entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. What he's saying here is, just as this guy, which I love this name, by the way, Melchizedek. Uh, Joy didn't like that for a boy name, but I thought it was really cool. Um, Melchizedek was a high priest in the Old Testament. And he says, in the same way that we had high priests in the Old Testament who entered into the Holy of Holies on our behalf to offer sacrifice for sin, so too did Jesus on our behalf. He is the great high priest. And because of that, because of what he has done to intercede with God on our behalf, we have a certain specific hope, which is now an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Meaning that if we have the hope, no matter the storms that blow in our life, we have an anchor and it's firm and it's secure, and it's certain, and it's certain for eternity. Peter says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you through who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So I have the hope and it is being protected not by my opinion on it. Not that I today feel hopeful and tomorrow I don't and well, maybe I have this and maybe, no. It is protected by the power of the Holy Spirit that it is firm and secure. John says that we have a hope in a daily Purpose. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it for the fullest, that every day the hope impacts me. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. So this, the hope that is constant and secure is a hope for the future. It is a hope for now. And it is a hope in a world that is not my home. The response to the mess that I was in because of my sin is not a hope in Christ. It is the hope in Christ. And we can't just be hopeful for these things. No, he is the God of the hope. I'm jumping ahead. And he says, may that God, the God of the hope, fill you 
with all joy and peace. And as we've talked about before, this idea of filling is filled to overflow. It's not full like a sonic drink is full, right? I mean, we don't want them to fill it to the very brim because it's going to spill all over the place. So they leave a little bit. We say, well, that's full. No, this fullness leaves no room for anything else. When Paul says to the church in Ephesus, don't give your body over to wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, give yourself over. Be filled so there's no room for anything else with the power of the Holy Spirit. If there, if I am full to overflowing with the Holy Spirit, then there's no room for worry. There's no room for doubt. There's no room for my own agenda. That's the design for us. And yet, if my life is a vessel that is designed to be filled with the hope and joy and peace of the Holy Spirit, I don't know about you, but I do this all the time. I push that out to put in worry. I push that out to put in things of the world. Sometimes I push that out to put in sin and think that's going to make me happy. Like If we believe God is God and he is the God of hope and he wants to fill me to overflowing, why would I then battle to put things in there that don't belong? That's the war that's within us that Paul talks about. I do the things I don't want to do. I don't do the things I want to do. Basically, he's saying, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I put things in there that don't belong. And sometimes I don't let the things that belong come in. That's the picture here. That God, who is the God of the hope, that hope fills us to overflowing. This is Paul's prayer for the church. He's He's praying that God would hear him in this and that, that they would be filled to overflowing with joy. When we think of Paul's writings, often we think about, you know, all the times when he's like, church, you're messing up. Church, do it differently. Church, why are you doing this? But you know, one of the major themes of his writing is the idea of the joy that we have in Christ. 21 times in the writing of Paul, he talks about, the joy that we have in the Lord. Now, again, this is not the joy that we have like Christmas morning that fades away. This is not the joy we have on a Saturday night, right? And I can tell you, last night, my house was joyful, right? I, I, I'm, I'm wearing this neon shirt for a reason. It was joyful at my house last night. Now, my joy did this. But at the end, when Baylor kicks a field goal and beats our rival TCU for the first time in five years, I'm just going to throw all that in. There was joy in my house. Hudson was up and running around. And I was on the sofa going like this. And Joy even got out of bed, came out and said, yay, and then went right back to bed. And I got texts from my family because they were all awake. So Katie and Cole are down in Lake Jackson and they're jumping around and my parents are excited and my nephew and niece and brother-in-law are at the game and they're on the field afterwards and they're sending us pictures. And then I get texts from my college roommates and then people are messaging me online. Like we had a whole community that was incredibly joyful last night. But you know what? They play at West Virginia in two weeks and we've never won a game there in our lives. It's, a, it's fun. It's fun when they win. It stinks when they lose. And I can be incredibly joyful in a moment. But even if they win the rest of their games, the joy of last night's not going to be there tomorrow. It's not there today. That's not the joy that he's talking about here. He is talking about the joy of the Lord. In the book of Nehemiah, you know, Nehemiah goes back to uh, destroy Jerusalem after uh, the exile. And they rebuild the walls and he's got all this opposition. And finally, after they rebuild the walls, somebody discovers the book of the law. And, and I picture it like they find it. It's like in a back closet covered in dust. 
somebody opens it and sees what it is and takes it to Nehemiah and they begin to read it for the people. And the people heard the book of the law and they were devastated because they realized how far from God they had become. And Nehemiah's response is, go have a party. That didn't seem right. No, we're supposed to like put coal on our heads and walk around wearing uncomfortable sackcloth. He says, no, enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve because the joy of the Lord is your strength. He says, because we are turning to God, we should rejoice. God is the God of joy. And when we encounter him and when we seek him and when we turn our lives toward him, yes, we look and sometimes when we go, oh, I wish it wasn't this way. But that's the joy of the Lord. It's not going to be this way forever. It's the same joy that we talked about last week that Jesus had when he endured the cross. This verse always jumps out at me that as Jesus was on the cross, his mindset to endure it was the joy of knowing that one day you would be in his presence. What got Jesus through the cross, which we know was like, he, he felt every bit of it. We know that before he went to it, he was struggling. He asked if there was another way. He sweat as if he was bleeding in prayer because he was pleading to God for another way. What got him through that? The joy of the Lord. And that is the joy that he wants to fill you with and me with. He also wants to fill us with peace. Peace that passes understanding in a troubled world that is not our home. I heard somebody on the news yesterday say, I, you know, I just can't wait to get till Tuesday night because then there will be peace. What country do they live in? I, I got news. There's not going to be peace Tuesday night. It's not like all this is going to be over and we're all going to be like, oh, everybody's going to get along now. Right? I mean, goodness, we, who knows when they're going to be able to count all the votes. And I, I mean, if you're looking for this election to bring peace, I'm sorry. In the same way, if you're looking for your bank account to bring peace or your relationship to bring peace or whatever else it is. The best relationships sometimes don't have peace. The best bank accounts sometimes don't have peace. No, God wants to fill us with this peace that passes understanding. Jesus told the disciples, I, I don't give you peace like the world has peace. So don't be afraid. He also said, in this world, you will have trouble, but I told you these things so that you might have peace. Take heart. I have overcome the world. So he says, may the God of the hope fill us to overflowing with a joy that is not dependent on our circumstances and a peace that passes understanding. And then this is the only part of the verse where we are called to do something. As you trust in him. I've mentioned this a couple of times, but in the Greek, there is a tense that we don't really understand or we don't really use in English. It's called a locative of sphere. Okay, doesn't mean anything. Basically, it puts you in a location of a certain thing. So the imagery here is that I draw a circle and that's where you find me. So literally, it actually says in the believing in him. It's in the, the habit of habitually dwelling, living. And so if I'm going to draw a circle and say, this is trusting God, what that verse says is I have to locate myself in the circle of trusting God. And when I do that, when I trust in him and live in this circle, then the God of the hope wants to fill me with all joy and peace. 
But the converse then would be true, that when I step out of the circle of believing and I locate myself somewhere else, I'm, I'm cutting off myself from what God wants to do in me and through me when I am believing. I read a, a great analogy this week that I hadn't heard before, that, that this is like being a deep sea diver. That a deep sea diver goes down there in the muck and the mud and they can stay down there for hours and hours in a place where you, you can't survive. As long as they're connected to the air hose. The air comes from above, it's pumped down below, and as long as they're connected to that air hose from the boat, they can do all kinds of things in a place that's not their home, that's not their natural habitat, because they are being supplied from the source. But the moment that hose kinks, and the moment the turn the valve off, or the moment the hose separates, now you're in trouble. Because now you're in an environment and a place that you're not designed for, that you're not equipped to handle, and you're going to be overwhelmed really quickly. Because we are a new creation in Christ, we are made to be in the circle of belief. And when we step out of that, when we start trusting in the things of the world, when we start trusting in ourselves, when we take our focus off of God and put it on my worry and my doubt, my fear and my anxiety and all these other things, I'm kinking my own air hose. The God of the hope desires to fill me to overflowing with joy and peace as I operate in the circle of believing, as I am connected to the source of life. This is why Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on, on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. What is that saying? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, Lean not on your own understanding. Nope, not going there. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And what? He will make your path straight. Same idea. We just ultimately have to ask ourselves the question, is God God or is he not? When I take myself out of the circle of living in believing, that's when I am truly vulnerable to this world. Now, we don't see it that way. We see it like, well, I'm protecting myself. I'm, I'm doing what I need. I, this is foolishness. And we need to see it that way. So that... Anytime you see Paul's writing say, so that you should slow down and read it again. Because Paul is making a direct relationship here, okay? I remember being in high school economics and we learned about direct and indirect relationships. This is a direct relationship. The so that, as we trust in him, the God of hope wants to fill us with joy and peace for the purpose of overflowing with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I read something this week that I'd, I'd never read before that the word for overflow here doesn't just mean to overflow. Because my picture, again, is always that like Route 44 sonic drink. Oh, like I have this cup and that God fills it to overflowing. The word for overflow in Romans 15, 13 describes a river that's come out of its banks. It's not, oh, look, I'm spilling hope. Oh, I'm, I'm going to leave a little trail of hope behind me. No, it is a river coming out of its banks. And if we know anything around here lately, we know what happens when a river goes out of its banks. It doesn't have to even be a river. 
You can't drive from here south and not see that months ago, that little creek that runs through our town rerouted people's futures because it overflowed. And when water overflows its banks, you can't contain it. And it has power to change things. And God is saying, if we live in the sphere of belief, he fills us with joy and peace so that we can be a river of change. The kind of force that can't be held back. Brad was telling me a story this week that a I, and I don't know the number of people, but that at Grace Pregnancy this week, there was a girl who came in convinced she was going to have an abortion and walked out with a plan of being a mother to her baby. And because of a river of hope that washed over her, it changed her direction. I, I love flying. I love all things flying. And I love to sit in the window seat and look out the window. I, I, I just, I, I am amazed by the whole process of flying. And Hudson will tell you, like, I have a YouTube channel where I just watch planes land live. That's dumb. But it's the same thing over and over. But I, I just like it. And I like flying over the Mississippi River. I like looking down and seeing it because it always fascinates me that there are places where the Mississippi River used to be right? Like it was the main channel of the river, but over time, a flood or something else changed it and it got cut off. And so now there's a lake over here and the whole river is going a new direction. God is saying to you and me that he wants us to live in this space so that we are in connection with the lifeline so that we are not just spilling a little hope here and there, but that we are a river of hope that is running through this world that is changing the direction of lives. Our county doesn't need a little sloshing of hope. It needs the body of Christ to be a raging river of hope that just sweeps them up in it. Just sweeps them up in it. After the nine o'clock service this morning in, in our traditional service, I got to speak with a guy who, whose friend has been praying for him for years and he came to church this morning and he's like, you know what? That's what I'm missing. And I didn't do that. That's somebody who's being a river of hope, sweeping up their friend in the current. That's what you and I are called to be. We got to quit being slossy Christians and be raging out of control river Christians that change the course. And it'll never be the same. And what I, am, what I am not saying is like, so you should go out and sign up for a program of First Baptist Church. No. I am saying live in this and then let God let make you into a river of hope. And then you come tell me what you're hopeful about. And look, I'll give you resources. We will fund it. We will see if there are other people that are involved and then you take it and then you just rage. I've, I've been in this cohort, I keep mentioning it, that, and I have a coach. And one of the things he challenged me with in the very beginning was, he's like, how many babies have you birthed over your years of ministry that have died as toddlers? I was like, that's a weird question. He's like, no. He's like, how many great ideas have you had that were going to change your county that never got off the ground? I'm like, I don't know, 150? Like, I don't know, a ton of them. I could probably start naming things. You go, oh, I remember when you talked about that. Oh. And he said, nobody wants to raise the baby if they didn't give birth to it. I'm like, 
That's powerful. So I want to empower you to birth your own baby in the thing that God has called you to do and then rage, rage, be a flood of hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. The word here is dynamite, dunamis. That's where we get dynamite from. So basically he says, I am praying that the God of the hope fills you to overflowing with joy and peace so that you would be a raging river and a stick of dynamite. We're not called to be um, touch-up artists. We're called to be dynamite. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the power to see things that only God can do, the power to change lives, the the power to come together. You know, I'm always saying the same thing, that we want to see things that only God can do or that we want to see God change this county from the inside out in such a way that only he would get the credit and he would get the glory. Like my ultimate dream for Polk County, Texas is that the state of Texas sends people here and they say, how are you doing what y'all are doing? Because your numbers are strange. They're weird. People are changing and, and these numbers are going down and these numbers are going down and these numbers are going up. And that the only answer that the Polk County government officials can be, I don't know, go talk to the churches. And we can say, God gives us hope and we rage. God gives us hope and we rage. And yeah, people are getting caught up in it. Channels are being changed. Lives are being altered. Hope is being found. So when I pray that prayer, every Sunday morning, what I am saying is, no matter what we've talked about, as you believe in the truth of who God is, may your takeaway be that God wants to fill you with hope and and joy and peace. Now go rage in the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, this ought to be like saying sick him to a dog or sick him to a bear. Every week, the prayer is take what we've learned, step further in the circle of belief and rage with the hope of Christ. Man, If I could do that, if you could do that, if we could do it together, if we could live in the circle of belief, there's just no telling what God could do. So I'm going to a little long, so I'm just going to pray for us and we're going to be dismissed today. If you need to talk about what it means to live in that hope, you can come catch me after the service, okay? We'll have a couple of us. We'll be down here. And I'd love to talk to you more about what it means to live in hope because maybe your response today is, man, whatever it is that you're selling, I hadn't bought. Whatever it is that you are, are talking about with this hope and joy and peace, I hadn't found it. I would, love, I would love to rage with you about the hope of who God is, okay? Let me pray and we'll be dismissed. God, I simply ask, that the God of hope would fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him so that we might overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love you guys. Thanks for being here this morning. Y'all have a great week. Don't take this flooding thing literally, right? We can get a good rain without having that, but spiritually, rage. Rage.